Hello and welcome everyone to the latest in our series of our hashtag I feel like talking series. Um, I'm delighted to be joined by my co-host for today, Caitlin. Uh, my name is Dane and we're going to be hosting this conversation about suicide and self-harm as part of a three-part video series. I'm going to hand over to Caitlin now to give herself a, a quick introduction to you all. Hi, my name is Caitlin. Um, I'm a medical student and I'm a member of the Young Scot Health Panel. Um, so the Health Panel is a group of young people from all across Scotland and we come together to discuss the health issues that are important to young people and try to create content in relation to that. We're delighted to be joined by Becky um, from Children's Mental Health Charity Place to Be. So Becky, could you tell us a little bit about what it is that you do? Sure, so I'm Becky Wilkinson Quinn and I'm the clinical lead for Place to Be in Wales and in Scotland. And I think you've said it, Caitlin, that we are the children's mental health charity. So we work with both primary and secondary school children and young people. And we also support like the system around children and young people. So we work with parents and we work with, with teachers also. Fantastic. Well, again, thank you so much for joining us for this um, three-part video series, Becky. It's great to have you here to answer some of the questions that, that young people have submitted to us about suicide and self-harm and all that kind of stuff. So, as I said before, this is the first part in a three-part video series. We're going to be chatting about suicide and self-harm. And in the other two videos, we're going to be talking a little bit more about support. So how you can get support for yourself and how you can give support to other people. We want to speak honestly about these issues and answer some of the questions that you've submitted to us. But before we go any further, we want to let you know that the topic and the discussion that we're having might be upsetting or triggering to some people. Absolutely. Look after your own mental health. Take care of your own well-being. That comes first. As we say, in this video, we are going to be chatting about suicide. We're going to be chatting about self-harm. However, in the next two videos, we're going to be looking a little bit more in-depth about the support available support available to you if you're struggling with any of the issues that we're covering or how you can give support to other people so if that's the kind of information that you're looking for check out of the check out those videos for anyone else though that is um, looking to speak to anyone you can get in touch with Childline you can speak to the Samaritans or give us a shout they're all organizations which offer free and confidential advice and information so check out any of those organizations if you do need to speak to someone right away so with that though, let's crack on and get into some of the questions. So as I said before, young people have submitted to questions to us that they want us to ask about suicide and self-harm. We're going to start off the conversation today looking more at suicide and then move on to self-harm later on. So let's start off with uh, perhaps defining some things uh, for people. So Becky, what are suicidal feelings or thoughts? Yeah, well... Suicide itself, it's, it's the act of intentionally taking your own life. So suicidal thoughts and feelings are just that, really. They're feelings and thoughts about ending your own life. And these could be just that. They could be just thoughts or they could be um, thoughts with a, a clear plan about how to, how to do that. Okay, and so could you explain a little bit more um, about what actually causes suicidal thoughts? Yeah, sure. And just, just to say that suicidal feelings and thoughts can affect anybody at any time. So that's, you know, I know we're talking about young people today, but that's regardless of, of age, of gender, of, of background, um, you know, and you might, you might not know what is the cause of, um, of the way that you're feeling. And it can be a whole sort of combination of factors and you know what I'm going to sort of lay out it's by no means a, an exhaustive list but you know it could be mental health problems it could be bereavement it could be you know forms of abuse it could be the ending of a relationship it could be pregnancy it could be sort of postnatal so you know after after pregnancy it could be isolation it could be housing issues it could be issues around you know finances money like money worries it could be addiction it could just be you know sort of doubts around um uh, around you know sort of feeling inadequate or um a failure it could be sort of other types of trauma it could be cultural pressures you know it it's it's really you know a myriad and you can see the sort of variety of, of different reasons that might 
that might lead somebody to feel that way, Caitlin? Absolutely. I think there is perhaps maybe a misconception out there that these kind of thoughts happen when you're feeling low or you know you're upset about something um, but there is obviously a, a wide wide range of issues that can lead to that those, that kind of thinking uh, the next question we have touches on something that you already spoke a little mm -hmm. bit about in your last answer there and um, but can these kind of thoughts be a result of a known or perhaps an underlying mental health mm -hmm. condition yeah well they can be of of course but you know not not necessarily so you know I think, as I said before, that, you know, that these issues and, and feelings can affect anybody, you know, at any age and we'll all struggle, all of us will struggle with our own mental health at some point in our lives. So it's just being really mindful of that and um, just being able to identify when you are struggling mentally and thinking about um, seeking some help, you know, or speaking to somebody about that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so could you give us a bit of advice on what people can do if they have suicidal feelings? Yeah, sure. So if you've got, um, you know, feelings of, um, you know, wanting to harm yourself in some way, I, I would say the first thing I would do is to talk to somebody that you trust, you know, and that could be a friend, it could be um, a member of your family, um, it could be somebody in your school, you know, your teacher or somebody else in your school that you trust. Um, or it could be a professional, you know, your GP is always a really good, um, solid first part of call. Um, but there are lots of organisations and I think you you highlighted a lot of those already, um, Dane, but um, give us a shout is great. So that's a 24 our um, text service. So, you know, if talking, for example, is, is difficult, you know, that's, that's another great way of sort of reaching out and, and getting support. So in, in that sort of scenario, you would start your text with connect. And the number for that is 85258. I'm sure that that'll be on, on your website anyway. So there's give us a shout, there's the Samaritans, there's Childline, if you're under 18 but I suppose what I want to really highlight particularly with them um, feelings of um of suicide is that there's 999 and there's A&E because you know it is it is a medical emergency so I just want to stress that too yeah definitely um absolutely right to highlight that if, if it is an urgent situation then 999 should be always your, your first port of call but brilliant that you've stressed a number of different organisations there, Becky. You've given some great information on where people can go to get the information and support that they need. There's not just one organisation or, or one place that you can go. There's lots and lots of options out there for you. Um, if you don't know where to start, then Young Scott does have a good mental health and wellbeing resource on our website at young.scott forward slash I feel. That's A-Y-E feel. If you go there, there's lots of articles with information, advice, and lots of links to different resources online and helplines and things like that where you can get in touch with different organisations to talk about whatever it is that you want to talk about. But we're going to move on just now. Um, just as a reminder, in the next couple of videos, we are going to go more in depth about that side of things in terms of support, where you can get support, where you can get support for other people. So if you do want to know more about that, check out those other two videos as well. Now, moving on, we're going to chat a little bit about self-harm now. So let's start at an obvious place. Becky, can you define a little bit what is self-harm? Yeah, sure. So self-harm um, is an act of harm done to oneself, by oneself. And it's um, usually done in response to some sort of mental um, distress, you know, some sort of psychological distress. Um, and often done without the intention of, of ending one's life, you know, it, it is um, a coping strategy. Um, and I know that we're going to come on to that a little bit later, but I just want to stress that because often there's the fear that there's a close connection or almost like a, a trajectory, you know, with, um, with self-harming and then, and then feeling suicidal. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I think there's often quite a lot of stereotypes and misconceptions when it comes to what self-harm looks like. 
Um, mm. So what are some of the different forms of self-harm? And do you think there's enough awareness around the fact that it doesn't always present in one way? Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, what I'm going to share with you today, I mean, it's again, it's not it's not an exhaustive um, list, um, but it, you're right, Caitlin, it comes in many, many forms. And some of these forms of self-harm are more easily spotted than others um, and just because of the often like hidden nature of, of self-harm and the feelings of, of shame that can come along with um, the self-harm as well. So um, we often think of cutting, don't we? I think when we think of um, self-harm, which, which would actually be termed as, as self-injury because we all, we all might harm ourselves in, in some way to, um, to cope um, with various you know, stresses and strains in life. Um, but cutting, you know, that, that isn't, as you've highlighted, the only um, method of self-harm. So it could be burning, it could be hair pulling, and that could be from like the head, it could be from the eyebrows and eyelashes as well. Um, it might be head banging, it might be sort of self-neglect, so not looking after ourselves and sort of on that spectrum there might also be things like like starving so um you might be sort of moving into more sort of like eating disorder type um territory with that sort of self-harm there might be things like self-poisoning i mean the, there's always there's always um new ways you know of, of self-harm that and one that has come up quite recently or sort of come into our awareness as professionals is around digital self-harm so that might be where somebody creates a like a fictitious profile of themselves and sort of abuses themselves on online so sort of trolls themselves online um, it might be pinching punching and um, sort of picking picking scabs and picking skin um, it might be excessive risk-taking behavior I mean you know part of being a young person is that you're going to take risks and that 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 is a really normal you know part of development but um I suppose we're talking about sort of excessively placing yourself in danger and that might also include sexually as well um it might be things like um inserting and and swallowing objects so as you can see there's um there's a huge variety you know in the ways that that people might choose to harm themselves and I think absolutely and um, Caitlin you know there could always be more awareness raising couldn't they you know about like the variety of it and what that might look like because I think like you say you know people often think of self-harm they think of cutting but um and also I think awareness raising about sort of how to how to spot you know, signs and also um, how to support yourself when you, you're witnessing that or you're hearing about that from somebody, but also how to get support for yourself. So, yeah, I'm always, always in favour of more awareness raising, definitely. Yeah, I think that's a really great point. Um, just as, you, as you're going through the list there of some other examples of what the forms of self-harm can take, I think raising awareness around that is absolutely essential like you say because mm -hmm. that, that can only lead to, to people being able to spot these things better having a better understanding of, of what form self-harm can take um, our next question that we're moving on to is looking more at what leads to self-harm yeah. uh, the question is can feelings of anger or being upset contribute to someone wanting to self-harm and if that's the case how can people manage those feelings yeah, absolutely. Um, and yes, um, feelings of anger and, and upset and sort of um, hyper stress, we, we might call it. So any sort of big feelings, big sort of overwhelming feelings can certainly contribute to somebody wanting to self-harm. And often when that's the case, um, there'll be a trigger. So there'll be all these big feelings and then there'll be something that happens that, that triggers self-harming behavior and usually in those circumstances what somebody is is getting you know from their coping strategy which is the self-harming behavior they'll experience some sort of relief or release um and maybe some sort of sense of control over those big feelings so that's what it it serves to achieve if you like 
Um, and certainly in, in terms of, of what you can do, um, I think it's important for you, you know, if you are self-harming, to be able to think about what, what are your triggers, you know? Um, so what feelings might lead to you um, self-harming and then finding alternate ways. It's always good to think before you're in those, you know, states of big feelings, you know, what, what might be your alternate, what, what you might do instead of. I suppose in terms of sort of dealing with big feelings, it's it's just like, um, you know, it's the general advice of, of how you can keep yourself, you know, mentally and physically well, isn't it? So it's, it's things like talking to somebody that you trust. It's like being creative. It might be sport for some people, you know, exercise. It might be, you know, getting in a big blanket and like watching a film and, you know, doing something that's like self-soothing, you know, so it's going to be, it's going to be different for everybody, isn't it? And it depends what, what big feelings you're, you're experiencing as in terms of like what you might do with that. But I think it's useful thinking about it in advance, you know? Yeah. So I know we're sort of talking about feelings there, um, but could you give us an idea of any of the other sort of circumstances that might be responsible for someone wanting to self-harm and how you can spot this? And I suppose that could be how you spot it within yourself or how you notice it in other people. Yeah, absolutely. So um, we often, you know, as professionals, like think about self-harm in uh, sort of like two sort of categories. So we'd have like the hyper stress, which would be, you know, the big feelings that we talked about. And then we'd have... Um, the dissociation so dissociation is where you like split off from your feelings so um somebody who might be quite dissociated might feel quite numb or um sort of unreal or um disconnected i suppose or alone or lost so almost more um more sort of depressive type um presentation or a uh, feelings and what the self-harm would um would serve to do you know that coping strategy is almost to like bring you back into contact with feeling so it's um being able to feel alive being able to feel real um and connecting in with the body um and i suppose in terms of um in terms of recognizing it within yourself, I think it's similar to the last question almost. It's just really thinking about what, what your triggers are, you know, to self-harm. Um, and if if you know that you are slipping into that frame of mind, you know, what, what could you do? What would work for you as either like an alternative or a, a distraction? I think in terms of spotting the signs, um, I would say, you know, for probably most people listening, we're talking about spotting the signs in a friend, aren't we? Um, and I think, you know, you know your friends and it's it's thinking about, you know, is there anything unusual, you know, about the presentation or is, is there anything you worried about? And one of the, the main things, if I had to give one piece of advice with, um, you know, suicidal feelings and thoughts and self-harm, it would be to ask, you're not gonna do any harm to anybody by asking outright you know are you thinking of ending your life are you are you harming yourself I'm worried that you're harming yourself and the sense of relief that people can experience in relation to being asked you know that just really direct question can be immense because it's it's kind of like it's shrouded in so much shame it can be like the elephant in the room do you know what I mean so it's it's naming that elephant really so that's a very long answer, Caitlin, but... <laughs> it's a great answer, though. Um, yeah, again, you've given lots of great advice there. I think particularly um, that last part, it's not an easy thing to do, but like you say, it can be such a such a massive step forward for that person if they, if they are coping, if they are trying to cope with something, if they're dealing with something that they've not told anyone about and you have spotted some signs, if you can bring that up with them and ask the question that can be a massive step forward for them uh, and, and for you to help them out as well. So I think it's a great piece of advice. Uh, our next question is, you've already touched on some of the uh, some of this in your last few answers, but mm -hmm. for anyone who is self-harming and they're looking to get to a place where, where they can stop that behaviour, what 
how can they deal with that? What advice could you give to them? So how can they deal with, with the self-harming and, and look to stop? Is that is that the question, Dane? Yeah. 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 So I think it's I think it's um remembering that um self-harming, you know, it's it's a behavioral coping strategy so it's something that we're that we're using to cope with something that's bothering us and that it can become a habit so um you know wanting to to stop you know it might not be the the most helpful goal in like the short term um and it can take time i think it's just remembering that it it can take time because it can become such a habit you know you know i feel like this and i and i do this Um, so it, it might be more helpful, like in, in the first um, case, to be thinking about sort of understanding what's, what's going on for you and thinking about what you can do, like in the short term. So it might be even things like um, delaying. Um, so I feel like this and I'm going to try and wait 15 minutes or even five minutes, you know, before I, I think about harming myself. Um, and this way you can, if you're able to do that, you can build up the time and hopefully, and distract yourself in that 15 minutes. So hopefully that urge, you know, that habitual behavior, like it passes the urge to do that. Um, I think it's, it's really acknowledging like each, each small step rather than like setting yourself, you know, a goal that might be unobtainable to stop. It's really um, thinking about the, the small achievements that might be quite significant. So it might be sort of taking better care of, of injuries. It might be reducing the severity of injuries. It might be, like I said, sort of increasing the amount of time between the urge and the act of, the act of doing. But I think there are lots of great things that you can try as well. And I, again, it's like simple stuff, really. It's you know, it's talking to somebody that you trust, whether that's like um, friends, whether that's family, whether that's a professional or a trusted adult, you know, of some sort. Um, and I think we spoke about before, it's working out, you know, your triggers and what leads you, you know, into the self-harming behavior and feelings that might lead you to, to harm. It's distraction. Distraction's a really great one and it can really help with that sort of extending that amount of time that you've been able to to wait things like um mindfulness i think the really great thing is that now you know lots of people have heard about mindfulness nowadays haven't they so it's thinking about sort of calming breathing exercises or anything that that you can do that's like a non-harmful way of relaxing so whatever works for you really i think um I think educating yourself is a, a really good one as well. So read about, you know, self-harming, suicidal feelings, what you can do to help. But also read about how you can keep yourself like mentally healthy. And for example, you know, I'm not, I'm not going to sort of blow my own trumpet. Well, I am actually. But if you look on the Place to Be website, for example, and there's tons of resources on there in terms of like how you can keep yourself mentally healthy and another great one that I discovered quite recently actually um, is there's a, a great NHL NHS app um, called distract and um, it's free and it's got some really great sort of strategies um, to try in that vein okay so our last question today is what is the best thing to do when you're self-harming and you want to stop at that moment instead of continuing yeah, and I think I think we've probably covered that in the last answer, haven't we, Caitlin? It was quite a, a long answer that one, but I think um, I think it's going to be different for different people because the reasons why we self harm is going to be different, um, and also the you know the methods for harming is going to be different as well. But I suppose if I had to give like two short answers to that, I would say distraction. So think about ways that you can distract yourself and think about alternative so um for example if your method of self-harming was um punching yourself is there something else you can punch i mean i'm talking like simple things here you know is there a cushion that you can punch and like scream into you know what 
what could be your alternative that might work for you in that moment and pre-preparing it, I suppose, you know? Absolutely. Um, like all of the, the advice that you've given, I think it's finding what works best for you um, is, is definitely a, a great way to approach it. Um, you'll be happy to hear that we've made our way through all of the questions that we wanted to ask that we had uh, submitted by young people to ask on this. So thank you so much for answering them for us, Becky. And you've given lots of great information um, and advice on lots of different issues. Hopefully we've cleared up some misconceptions um, and people watching this have maybe have a bit of a better understanding of the differences between suicide, self-harm, and what these terms actually mean and some of the things that that are involved uh, within that. I know it's definitely been really beneficial for me. I I've learned a lot over the course of, the of this conversation. Um, but yeah, that brings us kind of towards the end of, of the first video. If you want more information about any of these topics though, just now, uh, Samaritans, Childline, Young Minds and Papyrus and any of the other organisations that, that we've mentioned throughout the, the course of the conversation all have great free information available online. Okay, so as Dane said, that does bring us to the end of the video, but we do have two more videos to come where we'll be talking about how you can get support and how you can support others. So make sure to check those out.